we, we can just stop it. Oh, okay. there it is. It's, Debbie, it's working. I got it. Okay, good. I got it. All right. Okay. Okay. Does it say constitutional challenges during a pandemic? There we are. Y'all can see that? Yeah. 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 Everybody yeah. to mute because I'm hearing people's clocks yeah. and dogs. Mute yourselves. <laughs> and uh, so constitutional challenges during a pandemic. Like I said, there's just so many things to talk about this time. 2020 has just been a nightmare of a year. But the overwhelming um, thing is this pandemic, this COVID-19 coronavirus um, and, and the constitutional challenges to it. And when I first started looking at this, um, there, there's, there's so much. <laughs> so I'm just gonna try to, to narrow down as much as I possibly can to get through this. There's a lot going on. There's been already um, over a thousand lawsuits filed um, concerning constitutional challenges. There were 800 filed as of May. Um, and I'll talk about what some of those are towards the end. Um, okay. um, this content is intended to serve as general information. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> this is not legal advice. Do not, you know, hold me to any of this. Okay. So is it constitutional? What is happening in our world right now is it constitutional? And I tell you what, my first gut reaction when they started shutting things down was no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but you know what? It kind of is. Um, we are living in unprecedented times. How many times have you heard that this year? We're living in unprecedented times. And I would like some precedented times back. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> I'm ready for some precedented times. So we have global pandemics, mass quarantine. And schools and businesses forced to shut down, widespread unemployment, triple-digit government stimulus packages that they're still arguing over, out-of-control state and local micromanagement. So is it constitutional? Um, yeah, it kind of is. So what is the constitutional basis? We have to have a basis, right? Well, it's a little bit federal and a whole lot of state. So like I said, if you remember my talk a couple years ago on the sovereignty of the states, this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. So the power to respond to a public health crisis exists in the Constitution, in the state Constitution, regulations, and case law. There's a lot of different things that are coming together at this point. Um, the way they fit together, we're not sure about because why? Because it's un unprecedented. It's never happened before. There's not a playbook for it. Um, we don't, we're just playing, we're just winging it, basically. We're winging it. So the U.S. Constitution is a law of the land. We know that, right? It is the law of the land. We've talked about this um, many, many times with me. Um, but as I remind you, every time I talk to you, the Supreme Court has the power to change the Constitution. So the Constitution is as it was written. It is a remarkable piece of, um, of, of is a remarkable document, it's a remarkable framework. Um, the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review. That means they get to review all of the laws. And if they decide something is or isn't constitutional, they can rule on that and it will create case law that effectively changes the Constitution. And sometimes that change is good and sometimes it is not good. And when it's not good, there's just not a lot that we can do about it. Now, if they rule a law is unconstitutional, the legislature has the right to go back and change it and re redo the law or they just move on to do something else. Um, but a lot of what is legal in our country today is based on case law from the, the uh, Supreme Court rather than from the Constitution itself. So colonial times, this goes back to the very, very beginning of the country. Quarantines were a normal occurrence, okay? They were, people were quarantined all of the time because as you'll see from this quote, the colonies were basically fever ridden swamps. 
Um, there was malaria, there was yellow fever, there's typhoid, there's cholera. Um, there were a lot of illnesses going through and it was, and they took it quite naturally that they would lock down, that they would shut down and quarantine themselves. They didn't think anything of it. Um, once the, the, the country was formed, uh, once we became the United States of America, um, the federal government didn't do anything about it. They let the states and the local re, um, uh, uh, governments control it. So therefore we don't have, excuse me, we don't have um, any Supreme Court cases directly on point because nobody ever challenged it. And if nobody challenges it, then what? Then there is no uh, Supreme Court ruling. There's no, there's nobody looks at it. So eventually this overseeing our isolation quarantine became primarily a state power under the constitution, which is what we'll see in a moment. So the federal government derives its authority for isolation and quarantine from the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. I've spoken of the Commerce Clause in the past. Um, that clause permits Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. So what that means is when President Trump traveled from China and from Europe, he had the authority to do that under the Commerce Clause. If he stopped traveling from state to state, he has that power under the Commerce Clause. What he does not have the power clause is what we do within the states. He has no authority there. That is the domain of the governors. So the states are independent in this case. Um, so a little bit more on the Commerce Clause, sec Article 1, Section 8. Okay, so the First Amendment is the one that keeps popping up here, so we'll come back to that one. Um, First Amendment rights are not absolute. The government cannot prohibit these rights but they're able to put limitations on them. And every one of our rights has had some sort of limitation on it. Uh, we can't say anything we want at any time. Uh, we have limitations. Uh, we can't, we have limitations on our second amendment rights. We have limitations on most of our rights. Uh, and so this is not, so you can't say um, my rights are being violated when we see what the, um, how they're doing it is, as we go through this slideshow. Okay, so another way that the federal government has the right to tell us what to do and tell us to quarantine is under three, Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act. This gives the, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services the right to take measures to prevent the entry and spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into the United States and between states. So this is also Commerce Clause, okay? So this is just another wording of basically the same thing. It protects us from disease coming into the country and it protects us from disease going from state to state. Okay, now the U.S. Constitution, um, the government is set up so that we have, um, see if I can go. okay, so we, let me come back to this. Okay, I don't know what happened to it. Okay, so we have federal rights, or we have federal powers, we have state powers, right? So the Constitution says the federal government can do this, right? The state governments can do this. There's a few things that they can do together. There's some things that they can't do at all. And then the 10th Amendment says, whatever is not specifically assigned to the federal government is under the purview of the states. So let's look at the first bullet point on this slide. The term public health is never mentioned. Okay, it's not specifically given to the federal government, which means it goes to who? The states. So Article 1, Section 8, the Congress shall have power to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. And that gives the, the federal government a little bit of that power that we saw from the Commerce Act and from a couple of other things. The 10th Amendment is what I was just speaking of. So anything not stated in the Constitution is reserved to the states. Public health is not mentioned in the Constitution. Therefore, it is reserved to the states. And this has been um, confirmed via Supreme Court cases over the year, and we'll, we'll look at a few of those. Okay, so the federal government does have some things that it can do. Number one is funding, which we see a lot of funding going on, right? Um, through the Stafford Disaster Relief Emergency Assistance Act, 
FEMA is giving some money. The, the Congress is, is, is creating these acts that's, that's trillions of dollars flying around. The federal government can coordinate response powers. So this applies to any um, emergency situation and a pandemic would be considered an emergency situation. So um, they can coordinate response powers. This is an example when um, President Trump was sending the PPE equipment. He was setting up and regulating international borders. And what some other countries are doing to keep the disease out of their countries as well. Now, the necessary and proper clause is another one that gets tossed. Um, and that says that um, Congress shall have the power to make all laws be necessary for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers. So the necessary and proper clause is, is that kind of vague thing that, that gets um, used and abused occasionally because it says we can do what we need to do to make things happen that we do have the power to do. Now look at this, the bottom sentence there. The government has the authority under this clause to pass laws to commit individuals who are deemed dangerous to society. So guess what? Under a pandemic, if you are ill with the pandemic, you are deemed dangerous to society. So that is an overriding um, control right there. Now, this became, this became codified in Supreme Court case law in 1979 in Addington versus Texas. And in this case, the Supreme Court held that individuals with such severe mental illnesses that present a threat to their own safety or to the safety of others may be involuntarily confined to a mental hospital. Okay, so this was a Supreme Court ruling that says the government can put you in a mental hospital if they deem that you are dangerous. Now, the government may confine people against their will if these individuals present a danger to themselves or others, even if the person being confined has not committed a crime. All right. Now, in this particular case, they could lock you up forever. There was no end in sight. They didn't have to give you any kind of end in sight. They could lock you up. So this is the, the case law basis for quarantine that we're dealing with today. Now, and I'll tell you how that connection is in just a moment. In this case, they did find that the government must prove by clear and convincing evidence that such confinement is justified. Um, this is a much higher burden of proof than courts typically apply in civil cases. However, when it's the state, that um, burden of proof is less. So when the states are doing it, the burden of proof is less. Now, the burden for a COVID-19 quarantine is less because we have a set limit of time for a quarantine. If they put you in quarantine, it was 14 days, now it's 10 days. It has an end in sight, right? We have diagnostic testing that can say, okay, you do not have this disease any longer, therefore you do not need to be quarantined. So this burden is much less than saying someone is mentally ill and a danger to society. So therefore the, the, the COVID-19 quarantine, um, if they could put you in, if they could lock you up because they think you're mentally ill, they could absolutely lock you up because you have um, COVID-19. Does that make sense? It, it's, not, it's not what we want to hear, but that's what it is. Now, in um, Boumediene, I don't know, Boumediene versus Bush in 2008, um, we found that the court is likely to defer to the executive branch on matters related to national safety and security. This is why out of those thousands of court cases that have already been circulating around, most of them are getting tossed. Most of them are not going to be heard by a higher court. Um, and that is because of this quote right here. Neither the members of this court nor most federal judges begin the day with briefings that may describe new and serious threats to our nation and its people. And it is assumed that the president is. So the president is the executive branch. So the courts are likely to defer to the executive branch, assuming he has more information than they do. So this is a court case that established that. Now, here's the 10th amendment we talked about. Um, state powers are referred to as reserved powers. The states have the powers that are not granted to the federal government in the U.S. Constitution. Now, there's three types of powers that the state government has. One is the reserved powers. That's the one I just mentioned that says that um, if it's not the Constitution, 
if it's not specifically given to the federal government, if it's not specifically denied to the state governments, then it goes to the states. Now, you see that big blue arrow there? Police powers. This is the one we're going to be referring to um, for the next several slides. These are powers that are reserved to the state government to regulate the health, safety, and morals of its citizens. Regulation and enforcement are included in this. Police powers are what is giving these states the ability and the right to, to have these lockdown orders, these shutdown orders. Now, I agree with anybody out there who's saying, but some of these states are going a little bananas, and um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, but that is for them to deal with. That is for their citizenry to vote those people out if they're that unhappy about it. We've already seen recall, um, um, you know, requ requests to recall governors and mayors. So that is the proper, um, remedy for, for that. Concurrent powers are those that states and federal government share power. Okay, so state power. So the National Governors Association, which is a bipartisan, says that governors are responsible for ensuring that their state is adequately prepared for emergency disasters are handled at the local level and um and, and uh i can't i can't y'all are blocking my screen i can't see it uh, but require presidential disaster declaration to attract worldwide media attention would then go to the federal government to look at okay um states ah there we go um states retain significant emergency powers to regulate public safety and health through their own state constitutions and legal precedent dating back to the early 1800s. So the federal constitution, but each of these states has their own constitution that has given themselves certain rights and powers. Plus we have court cases that are federal and statewide in each of these states as well. So there's a lot, remember that one of those first slides where I said there's all these different um, things coming together right now and they've never had to work together like this. We are used to seeing an emergency on this part of the country or this part of the country. And now we have an emergency that's nationwide and there isn't a, a, a plan in place to coordinate everything. So that's why I think we're kind of winging it as we go here. Okay, so the police powers are the powers of a state government to make and enforce all laws necessary to preserve public health, safety, and general welfare. This applies to every single state. Okay, these are the states that these are the powers that they have to do everything that they're doing right now. Powers exercised by the states to enact legislation and promulgate regulations to protect the public health, welfare, and morals, and to protect the common good. Examples, um, infect investigations of infectious disease outbreaks, childhood vaccinations as condition for school entry, Born a uh, ban on distribution of free cigarette samples, involuntary detention of persons with certain communicable diseases, property seizure and destruction to control toxic substance threats. So every time a state government or local government does something like that, this is the power they have to do at the police powers. Now that doesn't mean they can do whatever they want. All right. Police powers cannot be arbitrary or oppressive. So we'll talk about that as we as we move forward. They can't be arbitrary. They have to have a reason behind it. They must be rationally related to public health, safety or general welfare. We have to have that tie in to show that this is helping this situation. They must be reasonably designed to correct a condition adversely affecting the public good and they cannot violate state and federal laws or constitutions. Um, so I think we already had this quote. Okay, so the police power and civil liberties. This is a few more examples of how this is used. Drunk driving cases. Um, can they make you do a field sobriety test? Can they um, have you do a breathalyzer or draw blood? These are where police powers come in. And whenever they are able to do this, courts usually side with the states on these, saying the society has the right to protect itself and to protect the public. So histor other historical uses of public health law and, and the police powers is wearing helmets on motorcycles, wearing seatbelts in cars. I remember everybody freaked out when they, we had to start wearing seatbelts, right? Um, bans on smoking, cell phone texting bans, all of these fall into the category of public health and police powers. The Constitution only limits police powers when states exercise them in a manner that is unreasonable 
unreasonable, arbitrary, or oppressive to rights and liberties protected by the Constitution itself. That is when these cases go to the courts and the court determines whether the police powers are being abused in this manner. So one of our first court cases to look at was in 1886, Morgan's Steamship Company versus the Louisiana Board of Health. Um, and what this, the result of it, I'm not gonna talk about all the case information, but the result of it was um, that it, it, the Supreme Court confirmed that Congress can act under the Commerce Clause to establish quarantines. Um, in Juho versus Williamson in California 1900, however, we have a case where a quarantine was overturned because um, they decided that the Chinese Americans were the ones that were um, more likely to pass along the disease. And so the, uh, the quarantine was unfairly applied to that one group of people and it was overturned. So that was a case where it was overturned because they felt it was arbitrary and not reasonable. Now, this is the flagship case right here. This is the one that overrides everything. This was 1904, Jacobson versus Massachusetts. And this has to do with smallpox vaccination. And Mr. Jacobson refused to have a smallpox vaccination. And there was a $5 fine if you refused to have this mandatory vaccination. Well, he said that in the past he had had a vaccine injury and his son had had a vaccine injury. And so they didn't want to have this vaccine and they didn't want to pay the $5 either. Um, and so it went to court and it was found that the, the, the requirement to have the vaccination was a legitimate exercise of the state's police power. And they said, this quote's really important, the danger of smallpox to the community greatly outweighed the individual dangers that a vaccine might suffer. So they acknowledged that this man might have an, an injury from it, but that the, the danger to the community greatly outweighed that. Um, so basically they found that the right of the state to endanger individuals for the benefit of society. Now, keep that one in mind as we move forward in our COVID-19 reality, um, and they are putting together a vaccine right now, and, and what um, this is the overriding case that's going to determine how they handle that one. So here's some more things about this. This was a 1902 small box, smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts. 1905 was when it was finally settled. Um, the Supreme Court said upon the principle of self-defense, a paramount necessity, a community has the right to protect itself against an epidemic of disease, which threatens the safety of its members. So that should sound very familiar to us in the year 2020. Uh, we find that the use of police powers for public health concerns was the overriding legal basis for this. Whoops. Um, the delegation of certain authorities to health agencies and other government subdivisions, they deferred to the health department. Um, the use of actions limiting individual liberty for well-established public health interventions was established as being an okay thing to happen. So let's talk about mask mandates. Um, Jacobson versus Massachusetts directly applies to mask mandates. If they can force you to have a vaccine, they can force you to wear a mask. Um, it's kind of the same idea because requiring people to wear a mask is significantly less intrusive than requiring vaccination. So it's clear that mask mandates are permissible exercise of state police powers. Therefore, I don't think you're gonna see any mask case get to the courts. If they're, they're just gonna be dismissed outright. They're not gonna go anywhere. Now, 1918 flu epidemic, we keep hearing about the 1918 flu epidemic because I guess that's the one that's kind of closest to what we're looking at right now. And in this one, the Supreme Court, the federal courts are not really involved because it's such a state and local matter. Um, and like I said earlier, there there's, aren't any court cases that came out of the 1918 flu epidemic. There's no case law because nobody challenged it. The federal government didn't really do anything. It was all state um, level um, mandates and quarantines and, and all of those kinds of things. The federal government left it up to the states, deciding that they're probably the best decision makers because they know the local circumstances, which is the rationale for any uh, local and state power, is we assume that they know best what is going on in their states. 
Um, Polly Price is a, is a First Amendment expert who wrote, I think it would be quite a calamity in many ways for the national government to take over local decision making. Still talking about police powers, the courts have consistently upheld the constitutionality of states' powers to quarantine and vaccinate individuals against their will for public health purposes and to enforce curfews or other lockdown measures during emergencies, to seize power property without a warrant if exigent circumstances exist, and even to declare martial law if necessary to maintain public order. It's law showing that this is constitutional. To answer my original question, is it constitutional? Yes. So, closed by state mandates, sorry for the inconvenience. Is it tragic that this is happening? Absolutely. Is it tragic that businesses are going under because of it? Absolutely. The government must choose a least restrictive means and it must be necessary to achieve a compelling governmental interest. Remember when I said that the police, po po uh, the police powers were not absolute, they were not, they cannot be arbitrary. This is the guideline we have to go by. Is it the least restrictive means and is it necessary to do whatever they say they are going to be doing? That is the bottom line that all of these cases have to answer to. Oops. Um, so is there a compelling governmental interest? Absolutely. Whatever you think about COVID-19, it is called a worldwide pandemic. It has affected 27 million people around the world and it's killed nearly 1 million people around the world. Um, our personal opinions on anything do not matter. All right. It, there is a compelling governmental interest to stop this pandemic and to protect the citizenry. There is no freestanding constitutional right to go about your normal life while an epidemic endangers many people's lives. At the same time, the government cannot simply confine people for arbitrary reasons. Um, so as much as I would like to just ignore everything that's happening um, and just do what I want to do, um, the, 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 the case law and constitution says I can't do that. William Barr, the Attorney General. Now, he is representing the federal government. He has let us know. He is keeping an eye on the states and what they're doing, and he has actually entered into a couple of these cases. And he said, coronavirus has required the imposition of extraordinary restrictions on all of our daily lives. Barr reiterated that while the Justice Department will not unduly interfere with the important effects of state, efforts of state and local officials to protect the public, the Constitution is not suspended in times of crisis. We still have our rights. We still have, um, they still have to prove that what they're doing is constitutional. So state powers, is this the least restrictive means? So we, if we establish that the government does have a compelling interest, the next question is, is this the least restrictive means? And this is where the courts come in. And something that was least restrictive in April um, may not be least, respect, least restrictive in September because things are changing, right? There's fewer people getting sick now. The death rate is going down. So something that might have been okay in April or May may not be okay in September or October. So some of these cases will probably be looked at more than once. Emergency orders by states should have a stated end with the option of renewal. If a governor issues an executive order that has what's called a sunset clause that says this will expire on this date, and then they have the option of renewing it, which is we are, we're seeing in Texas right now. Um, these, these orders have a, usually about a month and then they, they renew them, then the, the, the order is more likely to pass muster with the court. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the challenge to New Hampshire's ban on large gatherings. This was the first one that actually went to the court. And um, it was the challenge under the First Amendment. And New Hampshire put a ban on any gathering of 50 or more people. And so people challenged it. And the Merrimack County Superior Judge dismissed the challenge. Um, he said the court cannot imagine a more critical public objective than protecting the citizens of this state and this country from becoming sick and dying from this pandemic. Given the coronavirus's highly contagious nature, bans on large gatherings are well within state's police power and are going to be able to pass even the strictest of scrutiny from courts. 
Um, so that was the first one that actually worked its way through up to the some courts and it was it was tossed. So church restrictions, this is the one a lot of us have been paying attention to. Um, there's been a lot of jokes going around, let's have our church service at Walmart because apparently the disease does not exist. This results in some First Amendment challenges, which is our freedom of, of worship, our freedom to not have laws preventing our ability to worship. Now, as of early July, which is still a couple months back, more than 650 cases of the coronavirus were linked to 40 church and religious events across the U.S., according to the New York Times. Now, this disease is incredibly contagious. And so they have cases, there is one case of a choir that everybody in the choir got sick because it's so contagious. Now, does that mean they were hospitalized and died? No, I mean, the, most people get sick and then they get better, but that just shows how contagious it is, especially when it is, is airborne droplets and we're singing. So this is the, the compelling government interest that they're talking about with the churches. Now, most states included churches in their shutdown orders. If they um, exempted businesses, like here in Texas, we had, we had our essential workers that were not exempted, um, they are, or they were exempted from the shutdown orders. Most states were not included in these. So states that had shutdown orders, the churches were required to shut down as well. So many churches <laughs> filed legal challenges against their state's coronavirus restrictions. There have been many, many, many court cases um, involving churches. We're going to talk about a few of them, um, but there's been a lot. So uh, I thought this was funny. We're so lucky the virus won't spread at grocery stores, big retailers, and hardware stores. It's crazy how it only spreads at small businesses and churches. Shh, my dog is whining. Okay, so what is the legal authority to shut down a church? Well, in 1990, we had the case Employment Division versus Smith, which actually lowered the level of constitutional protection for free exercise of religion. And the bottom line is, is there a neutral law of general applicability? Do the closure orders specifically target churches or are they applied neutrally? If the law, if the shutdown specifically targets churches, it is not constitutional under any stretch of the imagination. But if there is a neutral law, um, it's applied neutrally to churches as well as other similar large gatherings, then it might be okay. So is there a compelling governmental interest? Is it being pursued by the least restrictive means? Does it prevent churches from providing their services? Now, this has been what has popped up in court decisions, the ones that have gone that have actually gone through the courts. This is what they come up with. It's not preventing the churches from providing their services. Churches have um, switched to um, online church services. Um, they are still able to, to, um, to serve their parishioners. Uh, if the state was preventing the churches from doing that, and we'll see a case that was kind of like that, um, then that would not be neutrally applied and that would not be okay. So Legacy Church Incorporated versus Kunkel in New Mexico last April is one of the ones that uh, has gone up through the courts. The church challenged the secretary for the New Mexico Department of Health's order prohibiting, among other things, all mass gatherings. This one was tossed. The court ruled that these closure orders do not specifically target churches and leave other large gatherings alone. They are in general blanket bans on large gatherings of all types. So they're a classic neutral law of general applicability under which a free exercise claim is going to fail. So most of the cases um, that the churches have brought have been tossed for this um, reason. Now we mentioned Walmart. Um, it does not. It, that does not um, enter into the equation. It, it, it has not come up in any court ruling that I've seen. What they're comparing it to would be performances, um, restaurant events, concerts, sporting events. All of those have been shut down. So they're putting the the, the churches in that category. Um, so these were two um, that had two that had a similar circumstance, but they had two different outcomes. They were both in April 2020. So on Fire Christian Center in Kentucky and Temple Baptist Church in Mississippi, both 
decided, hey, having a drive-in church service sounds like a great idea. Mom and I went to a drive-in Easter service where we sat in the car in the parking lot and watched, watched our church service. So both of these churches said, hey, that sound, this sounds like a great idea. We're going to do this. Um, and uh, the state said, no, you're not. You, you can't have a drive-in church service. Um, in fact, one of them, I think it was Temple Baptist Church, actually went through and put uh, tickets on all of the cars in the parking lot, uh, $500 fines, because they went to the drive-in church service. So both of these cases went to other courts, and um, they were both tossed because they found that that was not constitutional. The people were in their cars, um, they were not around other people, and there was absolutely no reason that they could not have their church service. Now, both of the cases were dropped when the states decided to change the rule. So I guess when the states realized that they weren't getting anywhere with it, they decided to change the policy and allow the drive-in church services and cancel the fines that they had issued against the people who had attended. Um, another big church case you might have heard about was in Florida. Pastor Rodney Howard Brown um, challenged Hillsborough County's order directing residents to remain at home except for essential, essential services, which did not include church. So um, he decided that he didn't like that and he was going to have church anyway. So he uh, went ahead and held his church services and uh, he was arrested. They actually arrested him. The state said his reckless disregard for human life put hundreds of people in his congregation at risk. Now, this case was ultimately dismissed. Um, and the state's official uh, statement said, since the arrest, he's maintained responsible social distancing on his church campus while engaging with community leaders in dialogue about the best path forward for his congregation. We've determined that prosecution or punishment would not provide increased protections for our community. So basically he gave in and, and decided to, to do what he, they wanted him to do. So he quit doing the, 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 um, the full church services. Now, an overwhelming majority of U.S. adults agree that houses of worship should be subject to the same rules on gathering and physical distancing. Even Christians um, in surveys are um, going along with this um, because they feel that the large gatherings are, you know, dangerous and they are still receiving their church services online or through some other means. Now, it doesn't matter what we think about things. It's just interesting to see what people think about these. Now, this case was Friends of Danny DeVito, which is not the actor Danny DeVito. This was a man named Danny DeVito who was running for Congress in Pennsylvania. And he and his friends challenged Pennsylvania's shutdown order. Now, Pennsylvania, they had a kind of an interesting way of doing it. They decided that life-giving services we have essential and non-essential they had life-giving and, and and not life-giving um were, were so not life-giving were um were shut down and so they took this one to court and the court threw it out they said your constitutional rights to free speech and assembly are not absolute states may place content neutral there's that neutral again time place and manner restrictions on speech and assembly as long as the restrictions further a substantial governmental interest and do not unreasonably limit alternative means of communication, such as online campaigning, which is what the congressman was complaining about. He couldn't go knock on people's doors. So they said he could still campaign, um, just not maybe the way he wanted to. So that case was also thrown out. So you're, you're going to see this a lot. A lot of these cases are not going to go anywhere because the standard for the state is relatively low for them to show that, um, that they have a governmental interest in protecting their citizenry and that they are being reasonable about what they're doing. Um, and so that neutral is a, is a really big keyword there. So a couple of other challenges, Second Amendment challenges, just briefly go through a few other th things. Uh, one of the things that New York and California did was shut down the gun shops. And so people said, no, you can't do that because that's the Second Amendment. Um, and the the, it never made it to court because the NRA successfully lobbied President Trump to add gun stores to a list of essential businesses. So when, this, when the states shut down non-essential businesses, the gun um, shops were not included. But that was a, that's the only Second Amendment challenge we're seeing right now. Now, there was a challenge here in Texas, you might have seen, based on the right to abortion. In March, uh, Greg Abbott banned, quote, non-essential medical procedures, including 
abortion unless it was necessary to protect a woman's health. Um, and this caused a big stink from a, you know, for a lot of people. Um, and so it went to court. And in April, the Fifth Circuit ruled that Texas could continue to prohibit abortions given the escalating spread of COVID-19. Um, this case is not over with, and I, I expect it to continue. Now, David French is a First Amendment um, expert and he compared these two cases and said the best argument that the gun rights activists would have is gonna be similar to the best argument the abortion rights people have. And that is that unlike a restriction on First Amendment free exercise where you can attend church virtually, um, by taking away these rights, you're essentially creating an extinction of the right. You're taking the right away completely by closing the gun shots, by closing the abortion clinics. People cannot access that right. Um, and so it's very different than a, um, than a church service that you can still go online. So I expect these cases to, to keep working their way up um, to the Supreme Court. Challenges to the Fourth Amendment is another one. This is what's going on right now. You might have heard about them wanting to track us. Um, there's apps you can put on your phone that will show, oh, you are within the vicinity of someone who is, is positive COVID-19. Um, and I was one of the ones that said, oh, no, you're not putting a tracker on my phone. Um, so this is one that they kind of backed off on a little bit. I haven't been hearing any more about it. Um, but if they do try to push it through, it's going to be, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a huge huge um, constitutional case because it is uh, an extreme um, violation there. Now, this quote is interesting, again, by David French, because his, his, his view, and which is my view also, is that once you give people a little bit of power, it's really hard to take that power back. And so even if something seems kind of not that big a deal at the moment. You have to look at what is the end point that could come from this. So what we're gonna see with these states um, and, and their restrictions is they're getting away with it now because they have a governmental interest. They have, you know, the, 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 the virus has been growing. But what happens in another couple of months when knock on wood, pray, you know, pray, 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 this thing goes away, how difficult is it gonna be to get these states to give up some of this power that they've taken. And that's what we have to watch out for. Is there going to still be a compelling governmental interest? We need to watch that in Texas and other states need to watch it in their states. So I expect another round of cases to, to start heading to the courts when the virus starts dying down, which hopefully it's going to do. So another one that came up is a right to a speedy trial. Um, courts were shut down. Courts were absolutely shut down for months. Um, this one is not going anywhere, though. The constitutional right to speedy trial is already more flexible. There's already been previous court cases where it's gotten a pass. Um, and in general, courts have given the tie to the government on this one. So people who might be saying that they, they've lost their right to speedy trial are probably just out of luck on that one. Jonathan Turley, you might know who, who he is. Um, he said, pandemic is not a magic word that instantly negates all individual constitutional rights. A pandemic gives states a compelling state purpose in the imposition of restrictions, but when the state denies or restricts constitutional rights, it must satisfy a balancing test, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. I thought this was hilarious. Me looking at my friends as I'm being dragged out of the health food store for not wearing a mask and reciting the constitution. I have a lot of friends who are very opposed to masks and they are doing their own little um, uh, resistance to them. Um, this one was funny. Costco decided a, a few months back that you couldn't shop there. This is before Abbott did his, his mask ruling. Um, Costco decided that they were not going to let you come in the store if you didn't have a mask. So uh, the boycott Costco, and so everybody said, we're going to boycott Costco now. So if you don't have a mask, you can't shop here. Okay, well, if you won't let me in without a mask, I'm not shopping here. Okay, that's what we said. Thank you very much. So civil disobedience is always a right that we have. And I have done, I've taught um, on civil disobedience. I love teaching on civil disobedience on Thoreau, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. They all teach us about civil disobedience. And what they teach us is if you practice civil disobedience, you have to be prepared to um, be punished for it. So if you break the law, 
um, you might go to jail. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail, so he knows that. Well, uh, Henry David Thoreau spent the night, spent a few nights in jail because he didn't want to pay a tax. Um, so civil disobedience requires um, taking the consequences of your actions, which means you might get tossed out of the store if you're not wearing your mask. It means that um, you uh, might not be allowed to go to school if you don't have your, your vaccine records. So, but civil disobedience is important because we have to stand up, we have to show. So in these states where the governors are being very oppressive, it is the right and the duty of its citizenry to say, we don't like this and we either want you out of power or we are just not going to participate in your in your laws. So don't be afraid to show civil disobedience and not follow the rules that are put in front of you, but do be, be prepared to, to endure the consequences of your actions. So coronavirus in Texas, briefly, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has issued 22 executive orders related to COVID-19. Most of these are renewals of earlier orders. So he issues a, a, a short-term order and then he renews it. So basically we have the mask mandate, we had um, the schools shutting down, the businesses shutting down. Um, so all of these are included in the executive orders. And a lot of people got really mad at Greg Abbott, but as we've seen, it is within his purview as governor of the state and under police powers to do this. And it's our right and privilege that if we don't like it, we let him know about it. Okay, so how does Greg Abbott have his power? From the Texas Disaster Act of 1975. So we talked about all the reasons the governor has the power to do what he's doing, but in Texas, the Texas Disaster Act of 1975 codified it. Um, it gives the state of Texas and local governments the authority to respond to emergencies, including pandemics. Once the governor and local governments declare a state of emergency, they may create emergency management plans that control the movement of people when it's necessary for the preservation of life or other disaster mitigation. So I've seen people um, online saying, oh, Abbott doesn't have the right to do this. He can't do this. Well, guess what? He can. And if you don't like it, you have the ability to, to not vote for him next time. Um, but, but he does have the, the power. So COVID-19 lawsuits, this is the last thing we're going to talk about really quickly. Um, as I said, over 1,000 lawsuits filed. These are some of the primary areas that they have been filed. Um, coronavirus workers' compensation claims, people who claim they contracted the disease while on the job. That's a lot of cases. Lawsuits against cruise lines. Do you remember back when this first started and people were trapped on those cruise ships that they couldn't dock, they couldn't get off of them? Well, all those people are suing the cruise lines now. Lawsuits against airlines for the same reasons. Lawsuits against healthcare companies, nursing homes. There's gonna be a lot of lawsuits related to nursing homes in this country. Assisted living facilities, healthcare facilities. Um, lawsuits against hotels. Lawsuits against daycares, um, lawsuits against companies that have been affected by COVID-19, including publicly traded companies that have lost billions of dollars in shares. I'm not really sure what um, remedy they think they're going to get for those. Lawsuits against federal, state, and local governments. Those are the ones we've been talking a little bit about. Lawsuits against insurance companies. You're going to see tons of insurance company lawsuits. We have the wrongful death lawsuits. Um, Let's see. Um, in lawsuits against China, there are multiple class action COVID-19 lawsuits against the uh, Chinese government, alleging it was negligent in attempting to contain the coronavirus and therefore contributed to the outbreak in the United States. So that will be very interesting to see how that turns out. I don't, I don't really foresee China caring one way or the other what we decide to do about it. Um, okay, so that is the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, I will do my best to answer. Thank you. I see hands clapping. Thank you. Um, like I said, I would, I would have 